Okay, good. So we have a small group. This is good. And um, so we can have discussion. So for the students, um, if you didn't, if I said something and you just didn't hear the word because like Zoom was being weird or something like that, um, speak up. Don't put it in the chat because I can't see the chat while I'm looking at my slides. So you should just actually interrupt me with your voice and say, can you say that again? Um, and then I look forward to your questions. I don't believe there's such a thing as a stupid question. So if there's something you're confused about or interested in, I'd rather that you just ask than not ask. Um, and nobody's going to broadcast it if you say something that like it turns out it's wrong or something like that. Um, so the title of the talk is Imprints of Microphysics on Large Scale Structure. So I think I, the area of work that I do is in particle cosmology. Um, and so I'm going to start by just kind of giving you like a clear definition of, of, of what cosmology is. I'm sure you know, but I like to give people what my perspective on it is. So the slide that you're looking at right now um, is basically asking, is basically a timeline of the universe. So from the bottom is what, however our part of space time started, maybe it was a big bang, maybe it wasn't a big bang. Um, and so the timeline goes upward. I spent a lot of my time thinking about what happened basically in the first three minutes. So when you get into the reddish region, um, and then I think a lot about what is the imprint of what happened in the first three minutes on things that we can see now. So at the top of the slide, the area um, that is called present. So the way that I like to think about cosmology is that cosmology is storytelling and the story that we're telling is figuring out the timeline of the history of the universe and the origin of everything inside of the universe. And so this is a particular way of telling that story. Humans have a lot of different ways of telling that story. This particular method involves using math and involves using what we believe to be universal physical laws um, and extrapolating from laws that we figured out from our experiences here on earth to how things happened in the early universe. So if you ask any physicist, what are the most exciting questions in the universe? Um, they're probably going to name whatever it is that they work on or the area that they work in. So I would say the most exciting questions in the universe for me are, are the ones that come up in cosmology. So for example, what is the dark matter? Um, how did we get from the first three minutes to the present? Like, how do we get from this particle physics soup to um, galaxies? So in some sense, that's the big question that I'm trying to answer is how do we get from just particles in this weird early universe stew to galaxies? So another way of thinking about this is that if we go to the smallest scales, um, so subparticle scale, one question that we have is what is the fundamental structure of space time? So when I started out as a graduate student, I actually wrote my dissertation working with folks who do loop quantum gravity work. So I was very interested in understanding cosmology from the perspective of quantum gravity. So understanding what is the fundamental nature of space time? Um, is it ordered or is it disordered? And how do we go from maybe what is a quantized space time to coarse grain, so to smooth out to something that we would consider to be classical. And so this was actually part of my dissertation work was, was thinking about the implications of this coarse greening process to, for a large scale structure and for large scales for space time and for cosmology. So somehow we go from this like quantized space time to a classical space time. So the one that we observe today where everything seems continuous, but there are these quantum fields on a classical background. So if you've ever heard of inflation, um, really inflation you can think of if, you know, from your first year mechanics class um, that you're, that maybe you're taking, that you took at university, thinking about like, um, some kind of ball in a potential well, that actually, I think that we cheat students by not telling them that um, the reason that that's an interesting problem to work on is that it comes up in every other area of physics. So for example, in cosmology, um, we spend a lot of time thinking about 
what is it like if we have a particle and a, a, a type of potential? And so we think that particles and you know, unusual potentials, unusual particles maybe drive the expansion of space time in, um, during the first second of the universe's existence. So again, we're trying to go from that quantum space time to thinking about a classical space time with some strange particles like the inflaton in some kind of potential well to go from that to what I would consider to be the first image of the seeds of structure formation. So this is um, an actual astronomical image. This is um, an image that was taken in the radio, in the microwave by the Planck telescope. So this is um, the European Space Agency Planck satellite. This is the cosmic microwave background radiation, which you may have heard of. So you'll see that on this image, there are uh, colors that are varying a little bit. These are actually amplifications. These differences, this map is basically the same everywhere. So the temperature is about 2.7 Kelvin. They've amplified the colors to show that there are variations one part in 10 to the five, some that are slightly hotter than that um, average 2.7 and some that are slightly colder. But again, one part in 10 to the five. So these are very small variations, but these very small variations when, get, when they are written large across the universe actually translate into um, structure formation. So what we're really looking at here is an imprint of the beginning of structure formation. So by structure formation, I mean stars, galaxies, us, right? So eventually we're trying to figure out how we get to us. So we're trying to go from that picture. So again, quantum space time to particles in, the, in potential wells in the background to somehow this cosmic microwave background radiation. And then somehow we go from this imprinted map, this temperature map, to cosmological scales. So this is Sloan Digital Sky Survey that shows lots and lots of galaxies and galaxy clusters and basically the cosmic web. So this is very large scale. Um, and so basically my job is trying to fill in the blanks on this timeline. How do we get from one point to another? How can we create a consistent mathematical story that gets us from point A to point B? Um, okay, so before I, I spend more time talking to you about my research, uh, Kitavi said it would be useful for me to introduce myself a little bit. Um, so I'll start by saying, so my name is pronounced Chanda Prescott Weinstein. And um, so I, I thought it would be fun on this slide to share. This is a photo of me with my parents when I was four years old. Um, my parents got divorced when I was five. So this was basically the last time that a photograph was ever taken of me with my parents until I graduated from college, from university actually. Um, so you can see that my mom is black and my dad is white. My mom is from Barbados and um, sometimes people ask me questions like how did your family get to Barbados? So we don't know exactly, but we know that they were kidnapped from Africa sometime in the 18th century. Um, we're pretty sure it was the 18th century. And um, so my mom was born in Barbados and she came to the United States when she was 12. Her um, grandmother had been in the United States since the 1920s. So my family has a, a complicated migration story to the United States. Um, my dad was born in Los Angeles. He was born in the US, but he spent most of his childhood and early adulthood in Trinidad and in the United Kingdom in London. And um, his family, he's Ashkenazi Jewish. His family ended up in the United States because they were escaping pogroms in Poland and Russia. Um, so my parents had two very different trajectories and their families had two very different trajectories to the Western hemisphere. Um, as I mentioned, they divorced when I was five and I was actually, um, even though my family is Caribbean and black Caribbean and Jewish, I grew up in a poor and working class um, Latino neighborhood in Los Angeles. So I have um, maybe some unusual cultural sensibilities because I was raised um, in a community that had a different cultural background than the one that my family came from. 
Um, <clears throat> and I was raised actually mostly by my mom. So I, I usually tell people that I was raised by a single mom. My dad was part of my life. He's still part of my life, but my mom was actually the one who was responsible for me. And um, we were low income. I went to public schools. Uh, and for me, this is, this is really important because it's shaped the way that I approach doing science. And it's also shaped the, the kinds of barriers that I have faced when, when, um, when trying to do science. Um, and I will just say that actually I was really excited to get this invitation from Katevi because I'm always looking for opportunities to connect um, with, with um, scientists on the African continent and with, with other black physicists. Uh, so just a few more helpful details. So I actually went to Canada to get my PhD. I went to work at Perimeter Institute at the, in the University of Waterloo. And I'm now known primarily for my work on axion dark matter and post-inflationary cosmology. I'm not going to talk about my post-inflationary work today. I'm just going to talk about axion dark matter. Maybe another time um, I, can, I can give a, a second talk or something like that. Um, so to contextualize things, I'm one of under 100 Black American women to hold a PhD from a Department of Physics. There's actually a website that um, tracks this. And to give you all some context for this, there are about 2,000 PhDs in physics granted every year in the United States. And if you add Canada, um, you know, there are a couple hundred more. But in all of American history, there have been under 100 Black American women to earn those degrees. So that contextualizes um, how bad the demographics are. So I also have a secondary research area. So I do anti-colonial feminist science, technology, and society studies. So I spend a lot of time thinking also about how um, race and gender and colonialism and um, capitalism and all of these things shape how we set scientific priorities, what kinds of scientific questions that we ask and who is encouraged and who is discouraged from participating in science. And um, so I just, I picked this slide because I wanted to give you all an example of the kinds of um, things that my science technology and society studies work requires me to learn about, which is that I spend a lot of time um, actually giving talks and writing about the fact that in the United States, we have a particular story about what a scientist is, what a scientist look like, looks like, and not just in 2020 in the present, but historically. And so I like to point out to people that Black scientists have always existed, that um, when we talk about, quote, diversity and inclusion, that um, even going back to the 18th century, there was, for example, Francois Fournier de Pesquet, who was a French and Haitian doctor. Um, there was Solomon Brown, who was born in the 1800s, who was a zoologist. Um, and I also think that when we talk about slavery, uh, we tend to think of people who were enslaved as kind of like thoughtless automatons who were just on the field, like picking cotton, or in the case of my mother's family, most likely picking sugar cane. Um, and it's not taken into account that these people were often the ones who were actually running the whole plantation, which actually if any of you have family members who are farmers or anything like that, you know that it's actually a, a difficult skill set and that it actually requires real knowledge to know how to run a plantation, to understand the agriculture, to understand the biology of the plants, and that also doing things like taking care, taking medical care of people on the plantation required a kind of expertise. Um, I also like to point out to people that, um, of course, in Africa, there were people who studied astronomy already, and this is not something that Europeans like handed down to people in Africa or in the Americas. Um, and actually, the first vaccinations that happened in the American colonies were due to an enslaved man named Onesimus, who introduced the idea in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, and basically saved the lives of many white colonists in the um, 17th century. So um, 
a lot of the stories that were told about the history of science in the United States are false. And so part of the work that I do is helping people understand what not being honest about the history of science does to our understanding of science and who scientists are. Um, okay, so the last thing that I'm gonna say about myself and then we'll go back to the big, um, much more sublime and interesting cosmological story is this to give you a, a little bit of a picture of what my academic trajectory has been. Um, so the way that I think about what I do is that cosmology is fundamental physics. Um, so I mentioned that my PhD dissertation was on um, cosmic acceleration or was on cosmology and quantum gravity. So I was particularly interested in how cosmic acceleration could be explained through modifications to general relativity or through connections to quantum gravity. So that was my dissertation work. And then as a postdoctoral researcher, um, I moved into doing, thinking about how we could understand the imprints of different quantum field theory calculations on cosmology. So one, how do we do calculations in quantum field theory? So I've written some formal mathematical um, in the direction of being very mathematical papers. Um, I also think a lot about the question of what is the dark matter, and I'm going to talk more about that for the rest of this talk. And then I've also been interested in the evolution of space-time and particle production. So that's some of my post-inflationary cosmology work that I'm not going to talk about today. So at the bottom of the slide, um, I actually have the seal of all of the institutions that I have gone through. So I started university in fall of 1999. I went to, I went from a uh, working class East Los Angeles to Harvard College, which was a, a, a pretty difficult transition for me. Um, I then started a PhD program at University of California, Santa Cruz. I started a PhD in astronomy. After a couple of years, I passed my qualifying exam. I was like well on my way. I realized I didn't really want to be in an astronomy department and I transferred. I took a fellowship that I had and transferred to the University of Waterloo and did my PhD work at the Perimeter Institute in Waterloo. Um, after I finished my PhD there, I took a, I, was, I won a NASA postdoctoral program fellowship to work at Goddard Space Flight Center. So I spent a year in the observational cosmology lab at NASA, which was pretty exciting and very different for me to do as a theoretical physicist. And then I won a fellowship, uh, the Martin Luther King Jr. Fellowship at MIT. So I stayed at MIT for four years where I was first at the Kavli Institute for Astrophysics. And then I moved to the, the Center for Theoretical Physics. And then after that, I was a research associate at the University of Washington in the particle theory group for a couple of years. And then for the last two years, I've been an assistant professor at the University of New Hampshire. Um, so for those of you who don't know North American geography very well, you wouldn't really have a sense of how much like bouncing around large distances this has involved. But basically, I've like moved across the continent a couple of times and I'm kind of hoping to never do that again. Um, so that's kind of my trajectory. Kitavi, is there anything that I should have said that I didn't say or that you think it would be no, useful no, for them to was, know? Uh, that was really uh, fantastic. And I hope uh, all the people connected, they see uh how impressive this trajectory has been and how uh, enriching in spite of, uh, you know, your, your challenging and humble beginning, uh, all of the things that you have achieved is really, really impressive. And I think uh, it gives uh, all of us here connected uh, a motivation that it is it's doable, it, it can be done. Um, yes. <laughs> so yeah, there are some comments on the chat. It's impressive and inspiring. That's exactly the point. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Thank you, Mohammed. Yeah, I'm looking at it. Yeah. I mean, and and I know that hopefully we have some time to talk after the talk. I'm. I, I know that it's important uh, for you all to talk physics, but if there are questions that you have, um, or you know things that you would like me to understand about, like the about your experience, then I hope that we have some time to talk about it when I'm done talking about the physics. Um, but I'm, I'm certainly happy to answer questions about what my experiences were along the way, because I know I gave a very quick introduction. Um, okay, so another way of thinking about the 
problems that I think about from a physical perspective is what is the universe made of? That's like in some sense, like a really fundamental question that whether or not you're a physicist, maybe at some point, um, you know, members of our family have thought about that, even if they're not physicists at all. Nobody in my family is a scientist, I should say, by the way. Um, my, my parents are both political organizers. My dad is a union man. My mom does like women's rights organizing. So this was all like completely me. Um, so one way of thinking about the, the, what the universe is made of at this point is that we tend, because we're used to our everyday lives, we tend to think of stuff that's like us as like what we would consider to be normal matter, right? But it actually turns out that the kind of matter that we are made of is maybe only 5% of the universe's energy content. Um, so I like, so really, so I put these pictures of people. So these, these people in the pictures are actually black Americans who have either been murdered or um, very violently harmed recently. And I like to put them on this, on this slide because I am, a lot of white scientists tend not to realize that actually sometimes they're thinking of black people as if we are not normal matter. And so I like to remind them that actually we are just like them. We are also normal. Um, we know that about 70% of the energy matter content in the universe is something we call dark energy. And um, in physics, we just tend to, and I should say we, in quotes, it's not the word that I would choose. Stuff gets called dark when we don't know what it is. <laughs> like when scientists are confused, they're like, that thing is dark. Um, so when we call it dark energy, it doesn't necessarily mean it's like, you know, it has dark coloring. It just means that like, we don't know what it is. Um, so we think about 70% of the energy content in the universe is something called dark energy. And this is driving cosmic acceleration, which I'm not gonna talk about today. And then maybe about 30%, uh, a little under 30% is something that we call dark matter. So when I say dark matter, what do I mean? Um, so, and what is the case for it? So this basically boils down to, um, as you all will recall from your mechanics classes, that if something is rotating, right, um, you can relate the, the speed of the rotation to how much mass there is. So we can do this with a galaxy, for example. We can look at how quickly stars are rotating around the center of a galaxy. And we can use that um, the size of the galaxy and the speed of the stars to calculate how much mass we expect to be in the, in the galaxy. It's also the case that we know that from looking at how much light is coming from the stars that we can estimate how much mass is in the stars. So you would expect that if you did both of those calculations that you would get the same amount of mass. But it actually turns out, as you can see on this plot, that when we do the luminous calculation based on the light, and when we do the calculation based on the velocity, so the velocity is the green, and the expectation um, from the light is the orange, that things are pretty divergent. So this suggests to us that there's a lot more mass in the galaxy than we can see. So there are two ways you can think about this problem. You can think about this problem as there's missing mass, or you can think about this problem as we are using the wrong laws of gravity to interpret our data. Um, so I just want to point out that people do work on modified gravity. It's considered to be a, um, a far less likely solution to the problem of, of this mismatch between the rotation curve and the luminosity. So we tend to consider this to be a dark matter problem, but it's an, it's an apparent problem um, that we need more mass than we can see. Um, so why is it called dark matter? Basically because it doesn't produce light. Um, if it did produce light, we wouldn't be having this problem with like measuring the luminosity, right? So it's only significant interaction we expect is gravity. That's not to say that the, it doesn't have any other interactions. And I think this is important because sometimes when we talk about dark matter, we talk about it like it's only interaction is with gravity. And if that's true, then we're wasting a lot of money on dark matter detection experiments that are predicated on it having other interactions. So as you'll see on this slide, I think that it should be called invisible matter or transparent matter because actually it's not dark, right? Dark things actually just absorb a lot of light. 
But in the case of dark matter, what actually happens is that light just goes through it. It doesn't have any interactions. So what do we usually call things that light goes through? We usually call them like invisible or transparent, right? So when you're thinking about how do I have some intuition for what the dark matter is, you should think that your intuition is that it's transparent, that light will just go right through it as if it's not there. I'm, so I mentioned that there's already this evidence from the rotation curves of galaxies. I also wanted to point out that um, we expect dark matter to be responsible for other things that we observe. So for example, um, here is an image from, I think this is maybe a Hubble. I'm, I'm pretty sure this is a Hubble image. I should have put a credit and I didn't. So don't be like me, always put credit image credits on your slides. Um, so you can see these arcs, these bluish arcs um, that kind of circle around um, the, Im the center of the image. So these are strong gravitational lenses where basically space time has been so warped by dark matter that is in between us and the galaxies that um, we are looking at in this image that space time is acting like a funhouse mirror. So it's really distorting the images. It's creating mirror images. There aren't actually multiple um, bluish galaxies. These are, these are mirror images that aren't real. It's very hard to explain this kind of gravitational lensing with modified gravity. And so this is one of the reasons people feel confident that there's something like the dark matter at play and not a need to change gravity. Um, so what do we know about dark matter? So we know that photons don't interact with it much, right? So I, I've said a few times that light basically just goes through it. Um, we are able to set limits on it just from looking at galaxy formation um, and the way that galaxies behave, that the particles move slowly. Um, the particles are not short-lived, right? So if they were short-lived, it would be very hard to stabilize galaxies because the particles would be popping in and out of existence. We know that they are consistent with hierarchical structure formation. So this means that stars form and then clusters of stars form and then eventually like galaxies evolve. And we know this basically from looking at simulations of, of, of like n body simulations of particles, that when we put these properties that the particle is short lived and moving slowly and not interacting with photons into a simulation, that we reproduce this hierarchical structure formation that's very consistent with our observations. So on large scales, the simulations and data match. And so actually, if you I, I, won't, I won't go all the way back to the other slides unless someone asks during the Q&A. But if you remember from the very early slide, I showed you some Sloan Digital Sky Survey data that showed the cosmic web. And you can think of this simulation image here as being kind of like if we had zoomed in on, on one piece of, of that Sloan Digital, Digital Sky Survey data. So things are very consistent. Um, so there's a real question though, which is on large, these things match on large scales, but I would still like to be able to write down an equation that distinctly says, this is the dark matter particle or particles, right? So I can write down an equation in quantum field theory that allows me to describe the electron and that allows me to describe the quarks that make up the proton and the neutron. So my question is, how do, what equation do I write down to describe the particle or particles that make up the dark matter? So I think it's really important to point out that there is no law of physics that says that it has to be one particle type. Um, we have for many years spent, um, focused most of our efforts on looking for one particle, but there isn't actually like any law of physics that says it, it has to be one particle. So the question of what is the dark matter is considered to be like beyond standard, beyond the standard model physics. Um, and this is like a super exciting problem if you're a theoretical physicist, because that means that your job is to sit around coming up with solutions. So this is a Venn diagram. Um, so 
this is like the greatest Venn diagram of all time. I wish that I had thought to make this. This was actually created by um, my Particles for Justice colleague, Tim Tate, who is a professor at University of California at Irvine. And um, what it shows is the relationship between lots of different dark matter candidates. Um, so I'll just identify a few things on the slide. On the lower right, you'll see something called the little Higgs and the littlest Higgs. So these are particles that have properties that are similar to the Higgs boson, but they are not the Higgs boson. Um, you'll also see in the top, there's a big bubble that's labeled supersymmetry on the right. So these are all things that folks who work at the Large Hadron Collider have been looking for. So lots of particles that come up in supersymmetric models make for good dark matter candidates. And it would be like a real game changer for dark matter, dark matter physics if we actually found evidence for supersymmetry. Um, I'm sure at this point, uh, there are lots of different opinions on this Zoom call about whether we're ever gonna see supersymmetry or not. So I don't have an opinion about that. I just, it would be nice if we did and sad if we don't. Um, and the other thing I like to point out is on the left side of the slide, you'll see that there is um, this bubble that has the word sterile neutrinos in it. So I just like to point out to people that sterile neutrinos are not the kind of neutrino that we have already observed. These are hypothesized. So pretty much all of the particles, all of the particles on this slide are hypothetical. We haven't seen any of them. These are just ideas. And we have ideas about how we would go looking for them. So like with the supersymmetric particles, we look for evidence of them in high energy collisions at colliders. Um, with the sterile neutrinos, there are direct detection experiments and also other ways of looking for them. Um, you'll notice that regular neutrinos are not on this slide because we now know that regular neutrinos are not massive enough to explain most of the dark matter problem. Um, so I always like to bet people, I think this is the best Venn diagram out there. If you find another Venn diagram that is better than this one, and you can convince me that it's better, I will send you $100. I've been making this bet with audiences for like seven years now, and nobody has sent, has sent me a better Venn diagram. So um, maybe it'll be you. Ah, so before I move on, I just wanna point out that I live in basically the bubble in the bottom left corner. Um, so I live in the axion like particle bubble and so for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna to talk to you all about axions and axion detection. Um, so what is an axion? Where does an axion come from? So the axion is a hypothetical particle. So we've never seen it. We don't know if it's real. It's a, and its origins are in a term that can be added to the quantum chromodynamics Lagrangian that breaks charge parity symmetry. So in essence, the way that constructing the standard model of particle physics works is you write down all of the terms that you're allowed to add to your Lagrangian. And then, and when I say you're allowed to, you write down terms and then you say, if this term is here, it violates Lorentz invariance, but we know it has to obey Lorentz invariance. So you throw out all of the terms that disobey Lorentz invariance. Um, you know that, uh, it has to obey U1 symmetry. So you throw out all of the terms that break, violate U1 symmetry. Um, so it turns out that we can add this term of the, following, of the form that's shown on the slide, and there's no argument for getting rid of the term. Like there's no fundamental physics argument that says this term can't be there. So the problem with adding this term is that when it's there, the neutron gains an electric dipole moment. We have never seen an electric dipole moment for the neutron, and so that suggests to us that this term should be zero, but there's no theoretical argument for why this term should go away. So this problem is potentially solvable. So this problem is known as the strong CP problem, this, the existence of this term, the fact that it's non-zero. 
And it's solvable using something called the Pecci Quinn mechanism. So Roberto Pecci and Helen Quinn um, came up with this model in the 1970s to solve the, the strong CP problem. And essentially they took the theta that I have highlighted here in red and the theta originally in this term is a coupling constant. They propose to upgrade it to a dynamical field. So um, I use field and particle interchangeably. Maybe some of you have had a quantum field theory class already um, if you're graduate students, um, but they basically upgrade it to a field, to a particle. And this means that there is an associated pseudoscalar um, which we now call the axion. And this axion gains a potential via gluon interactions. So basically the, the potential is related to quarks um, and it has a shift symmetry. Uh, so it has a Lagrangian of the form that's at the bottom of the slide. I know for some of you, some of this will be new or you haven't taken quantum field theory, that's okay. You can consider this slide as a taster of things that maybe you're gonna go look up and read a book about later and solve problems related to. Um, but mostly I want you to have a feel, this term shouldn't be here. And the goal is to figure out how to make it dynamically go to zero in a way that feels natural to us, where we're not fine tuning it by just declaring that it has to be zero. Um, so if you start to look into the literature on axions, you will notice that very rarely does the Lagrangian or the potential that you see look like the one I'm showing you on this slide. Often in the cosmological literature, you will see a potential that looks like this. So I've tried to map out for you what's important. So the V of phi is the axion potential where here phi is the axion field. The scales that appear in this potential, whenever you're looking at a potential, you wanna look at what are the scales that appear in this potential. Um, the scales are the quantum carbon dynamic scale and also something called the Pecci Quinn symmetry breaking scale. Um, it's also called the axion decay constant. That's this F. So in this approximation, which is known as the instanton approximation, um, we treat the potential as a sinusoidal. So this is a cosine potential. And that's related to the fact that it has a shift symmetry. So the shift symmetry encourages us to look at this as something that is sinusoidal in nature. Um, and then it's also useful to note that I, a lot of in, in the case where the field is very small, like for example, we're close to the minimum of the potential, we can, instead of using this cosine, we can actually just tailor expand the cosine and treat it as, for example, um, a Lagrangian with a mass term and a phi to the four potential. So this is something that like you could actually write down and all of you at this point know how to do Taylor expansions, I would assume. You can actually check um, so you'll see at the very bottom right side of the slide that um, I have an explanation of how the mass and how the little lambda are defined. So you can check that this Taylor expansion is correct. You can do this yourself. So you are now, you are now um, able to do calculations with axions. You didn't even realize that you were going to be there already, but here we are. Um, so I like to make a point of explaining to people what I have just been talking about is the QCD axion. Um, sometimes this is called a relic axion. So we expect in the cosmological timeline that these are gonna be made in the early universe during the Pecci Quinn symmetry breaking. Um, so early universe, it means before the universe became transparent to the cosmic microwave background radiation. So that happened at about a redshift of 1100. That's what the Z greater than 1100 means. Um, these can also be made thermally. So I'm gonna talk in a second about what that means. I like to show people the slide because actually, actually the word axion gets used in a lot of different ways. And you'll remember from the Venn diagram that there were QCD axions and then outside of that there was a bubble that said axion like particles. So axion like particles are particles with shift symmetries that are like the QCD axion, but maybe don't actually solve um, the strong CP problem. So these are sometimes motivated by string theory. So for those of you who are interested in string theory, there are some exciting axion connections there. 
Um, often the string theory axion like particles are also called ultralight axions. So these are axions that have a mass of about 10 to the minus 33 electron volts. So this is like, uh, don't quote me exactly, but something around like 10 to the minus 70 kilograms. Um, and these have a very different large scale structure formation phenomenology from the quantum chromodynamics axion, which is about 10 to the minus 5 EV, which I think is about like 10 to the minus 44 kilograms, something like that. You'll also see sometimes in the literature references to weakly interacting slim particles. So these are sometimes called WISPs. So these are light bosons. They're sometimes complex rather than real fields and they're not always scalars. So one of the things that you should take away from this talk is one that axions are interesting because we need them to solve a problem in the standard model, right? Like the Petchy Quinn solution has nothing to do with dark matter. It was just realized later that the axion fit the parameters to be a good candidate for the dark matter. So axions are interesting even if they're not dark matter. And ALPS, axion like particles like the ultralight axions, are also interesting even if they're not the dark matter because they are predicted in string theory. So there are lots of reasons to be interested in axions that are not directly related to dark matter, although dark matter is an exciting reason to be um, thinking about axions. So I mentioned that axions can also be thermal. So here I'm, I'm showing you a, a Lagrangian term. The axion has a coupling to the electromagnetic tensor. So this is the Faraday tensor that if you've taken um, junior level undergraduate electromagnetism or graduate electromagnetism, maybe you've seen this Faraday tensor, but this is just Maxwell's electromagnetism coupling to the axion field. The strength of this coupling is governed by G A gamma gamma, which is given here. So there's a lot happening here. What I want you to notice is that the mass of the pion is in here and that also um, the quarks are in here. So the quarks are represented by Z. So this coupling to electromagnetism means that there is possible thermal production of axions um, when it gets really hot, that maybe photons um, produce axions, for example, and that also um, axion photon scattering in the presence of astrophysical magnetic fields can occur. So again, you have this thermal production. This can be interesting outside of dark matter. Um, so I mentioned very, very briefly that the axion is a scalar particle. I actually called it a pseudoscalar. For our purposes, we'll just think of it as a scalar. So what could make, what could make that particularly interesting to us? So just as a reminder, fermions are particles that when they're, you know, relatively warm, they behave classically, they obey like a Maxwellian distribution. Um, when they get cold, they will stack, right? They will ladder. So they will drop into the lowest energy level available to them. But we know um, the Pauli exclusion principle governs their behavior, that they can't all drop into the same energy level. Whereas bosons will again behave like Maxwellian distribution. You can't tell the difference between bosons and fermions when they're really warm, really, right? But when they get cold, X bosons can drop into something called a Bose-Einstein condensate where they all share the same ground state. This happens below a critical temperature that's determined by usually the particle density and the potential that the particles are in. And so axions and fermions, when temperatures are low enough, can actually have very different phen phenomenologies. Um, Bose-Einstein condensates are a relatively recent phenomenon for us to form in the laboratory. But now there's an interesting question of can axions form Bose-Einstein condensates? Um, or are axion phenomenologies different from the phenomenologies of weakly interacting massive particles, which is a, a common fermionic paradigm um, for dark matter that's kind of a competitor to the axion. So lots of the supersymmetry particles, for example, are, are what we would call WIMPs. 
Um, so it turns out that when you write down the axion equations of motion um, or the equation of evolution, um, that if you ignore the last term, the gravitational interaction term in this equation, you would actually, and you ignore the self interaction, you would actually recognize that you have an equation that looks like the Schrodinger equation. When you add the self interaction in, um, so this, this term in the middle of the slide, um, this equation, if you ignore the gravitational interactions, is exactly what is either called the nonlinear Schrodinger equation sometimes, but in atomic physics, it's known as the gross pitayevsky equation. And the gross pitayevsky equation is the one that we use to describe a Bose-Einstein condensate. So it turns out that naturally, that Lagrangian, that phi to the four Lagrangian that I was showing you earlier, gives you an equation of evolution that describes axions in a Bose-Einstein condensate. So this is an idea that has been around for a while on and off. And um, 10 years ago, Sakivi and Yang proposed that this axion Bose-Einstein condensation would happen during the radiation dominated era. So they weren't really the first people to um, propose that scalar dark matter of some kind would form Bose-Einstein condensates, but they made a very specific proposal about the QCD axion, that it would happen during the radiation dominated era. So before the um, cosmic microwave background radiation started flowing freely, their motivation was that there would be such a high axion occupancy number, like 10 to the 61 particles, that the temperature would definitely be cold enough. And they claimed that the um, condensation would happen due to gravitational thermalization, not due to the fight of the four self interaction. So they claimed that that gravitational term was really important and that the Bose-Einstein condensate would have a correlation length that during the radiation era was Hubble scale. And that this would translate into regions of high density that were ring-like around galaxies. So traditional galaxy model theory says that there should be caustics of high density regions of dark matter that are spherical. But Sakivi claimed that actually you would get a ring-like caustic instead of a spherical caustic. So this is a very different phenomenology from other types of dark matter. Um, so I and Mark Hertzberg, who is a researcher now at a professor at Tufts University, along with um, our postdoc advisor, Alan Guth at MIT, got really interested in asking the question of whether this paper was correct. So we asked, do axion Bose-Einstein condensates with long correlations form? Um, and what we found actually was that the answer that was in CQB and Yang's paper wasn't quite correct. Obviously, like if you talk to Pierre Sakivi, he would disagree, but this is, we feel fairly confident about this. Um, this paper has actually been fairly highly cited. I put the archive number in the, in the bottom right in case you wanna look at a free copy of the paper. So what we found is that as with people, it matters whether particles are attracted or repulsed by one another. So it matters whether the self interaction of the particle, of the scalar particle is attractive or repulsive. And so um, what you're seeing on this plot here is that the characteristic wave number of the particle, so the characteristic wave number is going to determine the size of the Bose-Einstein condensate, that when the interaction of the particle is repulsive, the size can be um, very large. But when the, self, when the self interaction of the particle is attractive, then the size will actually be small. Um, so what we found is that you can't actually get these large scale, um, like tens of kiloparsecs caustics for an attractive interaction, interacting particle. And of course, that gravitational term is attractive interacting. And also the self interaction of the QCD axion in particular is attractive. So does axion like, do axion like particles form Bose-Einstein condensates? So we actually agreed with this conclusion, yes. 
In the case of the quantum chromodynamics particle, we found that this should be in small, locally correlated um, solitons. So solitons are basically macroscopic standing waves. Um, and these we would call, we can call Bose stars. That's often what they're called in the literature. My friend Anna Watts suggested to me the term asteroids because they would basically be asteroid sized. If the mass of the axion is about 10 to the minus five electron volts, then they will be about the size of an, the, the clumps that it will form are about the size of an asteroid, which is obviously like much smaller than a galaxy. Um, for ultralight axions that are much lighter, they're gonna have a much larger de Broglie wavelength so much larger um, characteristic wavelength. And they're going to be like dark matter halo size. So for those, you potentially still could have something that is galaxy sized, although it's not necessarily going to have a ring like structure. I think no one's ever actually been able to reproduce that claim about the ring that Sakibi and Yang made. Um, so I just wanted to point out that, so I've been, I spent a lot of time thinking about um, like smaller quantum chromodynamics axions for these lower mass, like 10 to the minus 21 EV um, ultralight axions. These models are often called fuzzy dark matter um, and, or wave dark matter. Um, so, and so this is a completely different area of research that I, I, I'm actually starting to work in, but I haven't had, I don't have time to talk to you all about today. So I also just wanted to mention that one of the questions that we're debating right now in, in axion physics is can we treat the field classically? Um, and can we use the Boltzmann equations to describe um, the, the condensation process and collisions between, between the particles. And so actually I, a paper, I have the archive number down here at the bottom of the screen with my uh, student, Tony Mirasola and his co-advisor, Kay Kirkpatrick, um, that we just had accepted to physical review D. Um, we point out that high occupancy number implies that axions can't be localized to a definite position and momentum and phase space. And so this actually means that some of the mathematical treatments that we've been seeing in the literature of axions is wrong. Um, what we do confirm is Sakivi's claim that you need gravitational interactions to form Bose-Einstein condensates on reasonable time scales, um, that you can't get the thermalization into a coherent momentum state without gravity on a time scale of the universe's existence. Um, but that's not to say the self interactions don't matter. They can still be impactful for the evolution of the system. And um, so I'm just going to show you all. So this is actually preliminary data. This has this is in a paper that maybe will go in the archive sometime in the next like week or two. Fingers crossed. Um, so what you're seeing here is um, ultralight axion solitons. So these are like halo scale. Um, solitons. And what you're seeing on the left hand side is a, a soliton orbiting a central potential. And as you can see, the evolution is different if there are no self interactions, if there are attractive self interactions, and if there are repulsive self interactions. And then what you see in the middle is the evolution of two solitons orbiting each other when there is no self interaction. So that's the middle two columns. And then the right two columns is, is two solitons orbiting each other when there is a self interaction. And so what you can see is that um, you're gonna have a merger when you have an attractive self interaction well, while where there's no self interaction, you have a very different phenomenology and things come out differently also when um, there is no, uh, when there is a repulsive interaction. So I encourage you all to look out for that paper with my student Noah Glennon. Um, okay, so I know I'm running low on time. So I just want to wrap up by telling you all a little bit about how we actually find axions. So part of what I've been talking about is thinking about what kinds of structures do axions form? 
so that we can compare our data about structures with our simulations of axions. So that's what I've been focused on. But we can also do direct detection experiments, for example. Um, as I mentioned, axions have an electromagnetic coupling. We can use the Primakov effect where you put, you have a, a, a container with a strong magnetic field, like eight Tesla. You wait for an axion to go through it, and then the axion will convert to two photons. So the axion dark matter experiment, which is one of the larger axion direct detection experiments in, in the world, um, uses this effect. I am, I'll just show you. So this is what their ostensibly what their plan was for actually searching um, micro electron volts, um, axion mass regime on, on the, the horizontal axis and on the vertical is the axion coupling constant. Um, so this is some of their more recent data. This isn't the most recent data, but this is from 2018. So this is basically zooming in on that previous slide. And so you can see that there's a lot of stuff happening here, which is that there are two different axion models. There's the DFSZ and the KSVZ model. And then also how we interpret our data depends on whether we are using an n-body simulation or a Maxwellian sim simulation of what um, the galaxy halo is like. So there are a lot of complicated um, pieces to understanding these direct detection experiments. Um, we can also place constraints on axions using observational astronomy and cosmology. So this is a plot from a white paper that a group of us, um, myself and some other people submitted to the Astronomy Decadal Survey in the United States last year. So you can see we can use the cosmic microwave background radiation to place constraints Another thing that you'll see on here is that BHSR is black hole super radiance. So you can look for resonances between black holes and ultralight axion fields. Um, Eridanus 2 is also looking at um, how galaxy um, halos and, for example, Lyman Alpha Forest. So you can use observational astronomy also to place constraints on what properties the axion can have. Um, and I guess the, the last thing that I wanted to point out is that you can actually do a lot with high energy astrophysics, so x-rays and gamma rays. So this is a figure, um, again, with mass on the bottom and um, the axion photon coupling on the vertical axis that looks at different constraints from different X-ray and gamma ray, so the Chandra X-ray telescope, the Fermi gamma ray telescope. Um, and this is a projection. This is a, a plot that was made for um, Team Strobex, which I lead at the um, Strobex experiment. So Strobex is a proposed um, X-ray telescope that we're currently waiting to see whether it will be recommended for funding. So this is an X-ray timing and spectroscopy experiment that potentially if Strobex is selected, if you end up coming to the United States to do, to do research, you could be involved in, in Strobex. Um, I, I hope there will be lots of exciting opportunities on Strobex. And one of the things that we can look for is photon axion conversions in neutron star atmospheres because neutron stars tend to have strong magnetic fields. Um, so I just kind of wanted to get you all thinking that we can do the axion direct detection experiment like ADMX on Earth with our like eight Tesla um, microwave cavity, but we can also think of neutron stars as like an ADMX in the sky. Um, so we can also look, for example, for cooling of neutron stars because of axion emission. So we can look um, so here's a simulation of how axions might cause um, neutron stars to cool. And um, we can pair Strobex data with Chandra and XMM Newton data to look for evidence that this cooling has in fact been happening due to axions. Um, okay, so we are just at the beginning. I know I've said a lot, um, so I'll stop here. I hope I convinced you that axions are interesting and that the phenomenology of axion dark matter is exciting for observational cosmology and astrophysics. And okay, I think we have like 25 minutes and we can chat about 
science, we can chat about, um, uh, you know, going to university and what it was like moving to Canada um, and being an immigrant, which maybe is an experience some of you already have had of moving um, to different places around the continent. I'm happy to answer questions about anything that I talked about um, on my slides. Thank you for coming. Chanda, thank you very much uh, for, for this talk. I think uh, I give uh, all the participants a flavor of uh, you know how diverse your your research has been uh, on fundamental physics and theoretical physics and and issues of diversity and inclusion and and how we advance science in a way that uh, all people can can participate and be treated equally um yeah, I guess so, I didn't talk about that much, so I'm happy to talk about that too. That's right. Yeah. So, so um, if people have uh, questions and uh, comments, uh, I think we should talk. I think you'll find that uh, uh, you know Chandra is very easy to talk to, and uh, and she'll be happy to answer all of your questions. Okay, Temi Topi. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Yes, thank you so much for the lecture. I just have a question to ask. There was a diagram she showed on her slide where, where she asked the question that where is dark matter? A diagram with different curves. So immediately after the diagram, she was talking about ASEAN and she said ASEANs are hypothetical hypothetical she made a statement there that they they are not discovered yet but then she made another statement that asian are interesting so i want to ask that is still is this still the same asian she's talking about or different types of asians so tell me topic could you state where which country are you from i'm from nigeria good good hey okay um so is this the diagram you were talking about Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so I, you refer to, I think, QCD, I think you were talking about, after talking about sterile neutrinos, you talked hmm. about QCD asions. Then you made a statement that every other thing, that the things around, they, they've not been discovered. Then you made a statement like maybe hypothetical, I can't, I can't remember the exact word you used. But hmm. then you asked, they, they are not, you used, the, you told us that the meaning, was that they are not discovered yet. Then you went further to say ASEAN are interested in solving this is a scalar particle. And so I want I wanted to know if both of the same is the same ASEAN you're talking about. Yeah. So okay. I'm this is this is a good question. And I'm actually uh, you should trust your memory. You have a very good memory of what I said. Um so everything on this slide is hypothetical. Nothing on this slide has been discovered. Okay. Um, yeah, so nothing on this slide has been discovered. Um, so essentially, I'll just back up a little bit. So this slide, the things that I showed you, so on this slide, I, I talked about the things that we know about dark matter. This is pretty much everything we know about dark matter. <laughs> It's so a part of it, and, and I didn't say this very explicitly, is that we know very, very little about dark matter. Most of what we know is um, what models of dark matter we've tried that are not consistent with, with these properties. Um, but we know very little because we've never seen dark matter in a, de a detector, like in a collider, we've never seen it. We've never seen it in a direct detection experiment. Um, as I said, because its primary interaction is with gravity, most of our evidence for dark matter is just from astronomical observations, which means that we haven't done anything that we might like, we might call like touching it, right? Or, or um, interacting with it in the lab or manipulating it in any way. We haven't, we haven't been able to find it and actually see it in any way. So what this means is that theoretical physicists like myself are sitting around coming up with models. Um, or in the case of, for example, supersymmetry and the axion, looking at particle models that exist for other reasons and saying, does this model have properties that would make it a good dark matter candidate? 
And so that's what's happening on this slide. So the sterile neutrino is actually another example of a particle that was actually developed to solve a different problem. And then people said, ah, but it also makes a good dark matter candidate. So that's a very common thing that people say um, are looking at particles that exist for uh, that exist in our models, right? Not in physical reality necessarily but that work in our models and saying this has properties that make it a better dark matter candidate. So does that, does that get a kind of the, the question that you were asking or um, you can tell me more if, if um, I haven't gotten to the question. Uh, tell me Tope, does that answer your question or you have a follow up? <laughs> Maybe we've lost her. Yeah, no, she's she's here, but uh, maybe. I'm sorry, a call came in, so disrupted the my connection. Uh... Oh no. <laughs> okay, did you did you did you get the answer? Do you have a follow up comment? Okay, while we are waiting for Timmy to come back, um, anybody else uh, has questions? Or uh, comments. I'm very sorry. Okay, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, she's um. Hello. Yes. Hi. I'm so sorry. A, a call, a, a call kept on coming in, and it was interrupting you my very connection. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. So she, she was talking about sterile neutrinos to be another um, undiscovered particle. I heard that at that, to that point. So she was trying to say something, but I didn't get what she yeah, was trying to yeah. say. Yeah, so I guess like, so my point about sterile neutrinos in general was that all of the particles that are on this diagram are particles, generally speaking, that someone, not, I guess like maybe not all of them. So I think the little Higgs is probably um, an example of something that wasn't, but a lot of them are particles that people developed to solve other problems. Like the sterile neutrino is related to like right-handedness and left-handedness and a lack of symmetry there with the neutrinos that we do know about. Um, and similarly, supersymmetry is there because we'd like to understand like beyond standard model physics. And in the process of studying these, these models of these hypothetical particles, um, people looked at them and said, ah, this particle also makes a good dark matter candidate. So, um, but every, so everything here is proposed. We just know very little about dark matter. And so actually part of, part of, I guess one thing that I didn't mention is that one of the reasons that Kitevi and I have been talking a lot is because um, we're both involved in the, the national particle physics planning process. And one of the things I'm currently responsible for is explaining how we will um, and why we should continue to search for dark matter and what are the ways that we are going to develop a better understanding of the properties. So I think basically the way I understood your question was, um, you know, what do we know about the dark matter in some sense? And the answer is that we know very little about it. And so um, the reason that this Venn diagram has so much stuff on it is that there are lots of different ideas. Okay, thank you very much. I, I actually thought you were talking about another ASEAN where you mentioned after this ah. vendor about another ASEAN, talking about the importance of that ASEAN. So I thought it was another particle. Maybe you were trying to make, make mention of another one that we should that, that we should take ah. that, that, is, that is interesting. No, ah. no, that is the same thing, ASEAN. Yes. So as, right, so this is another good question. And I actually, I like talking about this because actually a lot of physicists are confused about this and don't realize that they're confused about this. Like a lot of like very famous professors I've had like turn out to be very confused. So this is a good question. So I think, is it the next slide? No, it's a couple slides down. So on this slide, I talk about how the, the word axion gets used in a few different ways. So maybe this yeah. is also what you were thinking about. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so. Yes. There is the QCD axion, which um, I'll try and go back. 
right? So the QCD axion is this kind of like bubble in the corner, right? And then also on that slide, I talked about axion-like particles and that bubble is like a bigger bubble. So it contains QCD axions. The original Pechiquin axion is the QCD axion. What happened next in, the, in historical terms is that people started noticing that their, like, for example, string theory models had particles that had very similar properties to the QCD axion. Um, in particular, that they could be described by a scalar and that they had this shift symmetry. Um, so essentially, they could be described by the same phi to the four Lagrangian. Um, but maybe you would change the value of lambda and you would change the value of m. And so that whole category is called axion-like particles, but they aren't necessarily the QCD axion. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you, it answers it. Yes, awesome, good question. Um, thanks for thinking about all those things at the same time. Thank you. Um, other questions, uh, other comments? Like, uh, so I think you can see uh, that we are here at the intersection of particle physics and, and also understanding astrophysical and cosmological issues. Uh, uh, so it's, it's really very interesting. Uh, so there is a question on the chat. Uh, let me look. Um, please can action explain the universe missing mass and be the breakthrough for particle physics? Uh, yeah, I think that the axion can, but that's just my opinion, right? So the, there's like what I think would be interesting and exciting, and then there's what the universe is doing, and the universe doesn't have to do what I want. <laughs> um, so I think like the real question is, is whether we will find any evidence for the axion. And if we do find evidence for the axion, I think it could be very exciting. But at this point, this is all just us using our imaginations and, and thinking about what's possible. And, and that's really the job of a theoretical physicist is to make stuff up and be wrong a lot. So that's part of if you want to do this job, you have to be okay with being wrong very frequently. So uh, Chanda, so um, if we if you were to discover an action like particle, is there further step to demonstrate that it could be dark matter candidate, or is there a possibility that it might not be a dark matter uh, candidate? Yeah. So this is a good this is a good question. I think um, if we had a direct detection of an axion then the next question would be, what is the density of the axion? So if the density is too low, then we know that it can't be all of the dark matter and that we still have to go out and look for other explanations um, to completely explain the missing matter problem. And you remember I emphasized early in the talk that there was no universal law that said that the dark matter only had to be one particle. So we could be looking at a situation where we find particles that are basically dark matter particles, but there aren't enough of them for all of the dark matter to be that one particle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Other questions, uh, other comments? Hi. Hi, Mohammed. So uh, I have a question. First, uh, I want to thank Chandra for the very nice talk. So- thank you. Uh, so many uh, direct detection experiments represent your uh, result as a limit on the cross section. Mm. So sometimes it's a spin independent and sometimes it's a spin dependent uh, limit on the cross section. So uh, I, if, if it's possible, can you comment about the difference of these two interpretation or aspect? Uh, yeah, I'm, so we tend not to think of axion. So that's a, that's a really great question. So when we're thinking about um, weakly interacting massive particles, so let me go back to the Venn diagram. So something in the supersymmetry bubble, for example, we tend to think in terms of cross sections because those are, um, those are fields that will behave like particles in a collider, right? 
Um, so for example, at the Large Hadron Collider, where you will expect them to behave as if they were engaging in collisions. I didn't spend a lot of time talking about this, but in the case of axion-like particles, the part of what makes axion-like particles distinct is that you can treat them as if they are a classical field. And so they will behave like a wave. And so instead of thinking about particle collisions, you'll be thinking about waves that are interfering with each other, for example. So I'm gonna go, um, so for example, this fuzzy dark matter picture, this is a very nice one. So you'll see that there are places where, um, you know, there's color and then it'll look like it's kind of stringy, like there are lines, but you can kind of see that there are interference patterns happening here, right? Um, so in the case of something like fuzzy dark matter, instead of thinking about cross sections, like you can think about scattering in some sense, but I think it's a less productive way to think about it. So we tend not to give information about axions in terms of cross sections, um, which actually makes like doing comparisons really hard. This is something that in the snowmass process right now, we're actually talking about how do we make a fiducial model where you have different models of dark matter where you can include like um, wave dark matter and particle dark matter on the same plot in a way that makes sense for both of them. Does that answer your question? Yeah, uh, uh, so uh, thanks first. And so uh, the aspect that I'm talking about, it's mainly for, uh, for WIMPs uh, and so my point is, uh, is it possible, for example, to go from, if we have like a, a result from an experiment, uh, uh, which is a spin independent, interpreted to a spin independent result, can we, can we go to find, is there a way to find the spin dependent or, or in, in, so I, I th I th if I understand your question correctly, you're, you're wondering like, how would I know if this was a fermion or a boson, right? That's part of it. Like, how would I know if it had like a half spin, multiple of a half spin or, um, or something that has a, an integer spin? So part of it is I would look for this kind of behavior. Does it map, does it behave like a wave or does it behave like a particle that's colliding? The helpful thing is that usually these experiments are very, um, part of, very dependent on what particular particle you're looking for. So I'm not too worried that if I am doing a WIMP direct detection experiment that I will see an axion instead. Um, because the, the interactions with the standard model are so different that probably my experiment is only tuned for one of them, but not for both of them. If we find something, then we have to worry about characterizing each property, including trying to measure the spin. Yeah, so I guess actually maybe this is a better question for Kitevi since I'm just like a theorist. No, 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 <laughs> it's, uh, I'm, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just adding to your to your answer. Actually, <laughs> Mohammed and I are working on. Uh, uh, you know, he's a graduate student from Morocco, but uh, he's working with me on uh, Higgs to invisible search. Okay. And uh, interpretation for dark matter using the Higgs portal model. So, okay, so it sounds like I need to listen to a talk from yes, you guys so that I can so, learn about this. So, uh, Mohammed spends a lot of time making uh, uh, making. Uh, uh, you know, um, interpretation for dark matter nucleon scattering through the Higgs portal model and then comparing to direct det detection experiment. Um, so that's that's like a part of uh, a part of his uh, his thesis. Okay, and, awesome. Uh, yeah. So, but you know, he's he's based in Morocco and he's really uh, so I, I I work with a number of. The number of the people connected here, you know, well, not all of them, but it's only Mohammed. The other ones are not connected. Here. But uh, yeah, so 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 that's uh, that's that's what he's uh, what what he's uh, focusing on right now. 
Um, the direct detection experiment uh, usually they make this uh, like when you have the xenon one T and all those. Yes. Yeah, they usually make that plot of uh, uh, that shows uh, their exclusion limits in the in the plane of uh, the scattering amplitude or cross section between dark matter and the nucleon. Yeah. The dark matter mass. Yeah. So. Usually, normally you can then interpret that stuff for, you know, it's spin dependent or spin independent or type of a mediator or something like that. I think that's, Mohammed, is that where the question is? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So I guess what I would say is that in the case of an axion, you're not looking for something that's scattering off a nucleon, right? Mm -hmm. So you're always going to be looking for in the case of direct detection, I should be clear about that. You're always going to be looking for something like this Primakov effect, or there are some like equivalents where there are interactions with nucleons, for example. Um, but it won't be scattering um, so much as decay, mm -hmm. which is which is different, right? So you'll be thinking about like how do I cause a decay? Um, I have a nucleon into axions or axions into nucleon or in the case uh, of like ADMX and axion into photons. Um, so in that case, the cross section doesn't matter so much because you're not actually doing scattering. You're just looking for creating the conditions to make the particles decay. I, th I think that that's how I would think about the difference. But again, I'm not an experimentalist. So I don't know if that's the right yeah, way to no, think no, about I it. I think I think that is that is fine, Chandra. I think a follow up question that I may have to the one Mohammed have is, uh, you know, the the wind paradigm, which um, now is, you know we haven't seen wimps and so forth, and people are beginning to <laughs> move away from, uh, you know, from uh, dark matter as a wimp. Does that like, does that you know uh, help? The case for the axion, since we really have not seen in the way that's, you know, other form of dark matter, including the axion, axion like particle, are they like gaining ground or more acceptance in the community because the wing paradigm has unfortunately been disappointing? We haven't really observed it. So, I mean, I guess I see this as like maybe a political question and not a scientific question in the <laughs> sense that, like, <laughs> It's definitely the case that because there hasn't been any success with WIMPs that I think that I'm, when I first wrote that paper with Mark Hertzberg and Alan Guth back in 2014, like talking about axion Bose-Einstein condensates, I wouldn't call it fringe, but in the United States, there weren't many people who were thinking about that. And a lot of people thought Sakivi's paper was wrong, but nobody was trying to figure out how it was wrong. Mm -hmm. And I spent like a year and a half going around giving talks about that paper. And now <laughs> it's 2020 and everybody's like axion Bose Einstein condensates this, axion solitons, ultralight axion dark matter. Um, it's exploded as a field. And I definitely think that part of that is people who thought they were going to see supersymmetry at the LHC and didn't started looking for something else to do with their time. Mm -hmm. because people got kind of sad. It's like, I really think this is partly physicist psychology is that people got depressed about supersymmetry and switched to working on axions. Um, and I think like the funding has reflected this, which is that uh, there are a bunch of like private funders like Heisen Simons Foundation and um, like some other foundations that started giving money to axions. And so I think that the lack of discoveries with WIMPs has made people feel urgency around looking for something else that might give them the win that they didn't get with WIMPs. I'm not sure that that actually translates into any scientific differences, right? Like just because we're looking for the axion doesn't mean the universe is gonna give us one. Yeah. I think I'm supposed to be more optimistic about it, but like <laughs> in the same way that like the same thing that's hap that happened with WIMPs could happen with axions. So we spend a lot of money looking for it, we don't find it. And then um, the thing is, is that just because we haven't found it doesn't mean it's not there. Like, I still think it's a possibility we will see WIMPs. Yeah, yeah. No, that is so. Uh, yeah, yeah. People are still looking. There are still diehard people who want to 
uh, still believe in supersymmetry. So. <laughs> yes, I mean, also, of course, like, and of course, there's you now the debate of like, you can just keep shifting supersymmetry to higher and higher levels until you need like a collider that circles the earth, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so some of that is, but it's also the case that maybe that is actually where supersymmetry is. There's no law of physics that says it's not there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we may, it may be difficult to access or it may require different type of uh, accelerators or detection system to be able to get it. Yes, so yeah. I think I part, being a theorist is, I mean, I think being a physicist is a very humbling experience, right? Because you're wrong a lot, things don't work a lot, you don't see the thing that you wanted to see, you get lots of negative results. Um, and part of it is that like, at the end of the day, our job is to characterize how the universe actually is. So a negative result is an important one because now we know where dark matter isn't. <laughs> yeah. Um, other questions, uh, other comments? Uh, um, are, are people working in related fields and we want to share some interesting experience or different perspective? Hi, Kitivi. Hi, Mohamed. Yes. Yeah, so it's about the latest results from, uh, from the Xeno anti experiment. Mm. So, from the range of the mass of the, of the axion, it's, it's clearly it's, uh, it's very uh, small comparing to, uh, to the range where we are looking for WIMPs. But uh, I don't know if, if you read the, uh, the paper, but it seems like the, they found some axis and uh, they say that it's can, it can be in axions or, or a, a vector uh, boson dark matter. Yeah, so I would say I'm pretty skeptical about the Xenon 1T results. Um, because they found, I think they found, they claim axion detection at 3.2 sigma. I think it was 3.2. But they also showed that it could be hydrogen to 3 sigma, which to me is about the same. Um, so I would like, I need 4 sigma at least. I would like to see 5 sigma <laughs> before I would be convinced. But I definitely think the fact that it was almost equally possible that it was something from the standard model made me very skeptical, which is one of the reasons, like at this point, I don't even talk about the Xenon 1T in my talks really, um, because I don't think it's an actual detection yet. Yeah, also uh, the, the axis is at uh, it's a little bit heavy. Sorry, I missed what you said. Can you repeat it? Yeah, so also, the, the, uh, in their claim, uh, where they found the, which is a little bit, I think, it's uh, heavy for, for Axiom. Yeah, so definitely, I think, I, I just think there are lots of questions there. And I honestly, I will say that I'm not even sure that they take it very seriously because the way that they made the announcement, I am, this is gonna sound terrible, but I think that if they really thought it was an axion, they probably wouldn't have let a graduate student give the talk. Maybe they should, but I don't, I, I don't believe that they would have if they really believe the result themselves. So I'm not even convinced the team is super behind the idea as one that will stand the test of time. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, normally uh, we have these announcements and then with more data and then uh, yeah. significance decreases and so forth. So, yeah. But yeah, we'll see whether it's uh, something that we should be excited about or not. Um, other questions or other comments? Um, I, you know, there are some people who are in uh, astrophysics or cosmology. You guys have some perspectives here, or you want to tell us how things, uh, what's the situation on your side in terms of uh, some of these big questions about the universe? 
Beatrice, I think you are doing astrophysics, right? Or cosmology. I'm calling people's name with that. Uh... <laughs> Timmy Topi have another question or comment. Please go ahead. Yeah. Once again, I just want to um, I just want to ask one question just to clarify my my doubt. You know, she was talking about dark matter as being referred to as being transparent or invisible. So I want to ask her, uh, is it a personal opinion or based on what she had she had seen so far? And what made her feel feel mm. to call it invisible or transparent since she said she said since she said it is not based on the fact that it is without light that we call it dark so yeah so this is a good question i'm definitely the standard term for it in professional circles is dark matter um but you'll also see actually like i'll give you all like an example i am um, so this is a new book by P.J. Peebles, who you might recognize his name because he won the Nobel Prize last year for his contributions to cosmology. Yeah. Um, so in this book, he calls it subluminal matter. Um, so it is still the case that the reason that it's called dark matter is purely for historical reasons. And that's often the case a lot in physics. Um, like a really good example in my book, I write about how um, in the 1960s, when they were creating quantum chromodynamics, they called quantum, they started referring to it as colored physics. So I know that the word colored has different connotations, for example, for folks in South Africa, but in the United States, um, colored is not a particularly like nice way to, nice word to use. Um, so I write in my book about how people called it colored physics, basically because it was a group of white people who felt very comfortable using that term, even though it actually isn't like a, necessarily a particularly good term to use in an American context. Um, so the reason that it's called dark matter is purely because that was the term that Fritz Vicky used in 1933. That was back before anybody had any a, a sense of what its properties would it all be like. Um, and I think it's a very social decision to call it dark matter. Technically speaking, I think everybody would agree that the property that it has is that it is transparent, that light goes through it typically. Um, there are exceptions where light will interact with it, but you have to have the right conditions for light to interact with it. So I think that there would be widespread agreement in the physics community that transparency or invisibility is a property that it has we just call it dark matter for historical reasons. Does that does that answer your question, Temi Topi? Yes, perfectly. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, there, there's always a social component. I think that that would be my lesson. In yeah, whatever language we're using, there's always a social component. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same thing with dark energy. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, other question, uh, other comments? So I think we will invite uh, Chanda back again at some point, either online or when we have our school, so that uh, you know she can, you can, you see from, <clears throat> excuse me, from her profile that she can talk to us about many things, uh, different dimensions, uh, things that you know her experience. Uh, many of us can share growing up, going to school and having to go through a lot of trouble to get where she is right now. So I hope that gives us uh, the inspiration, like we said. Um, so, uh, and that, uh, you know, we have come on and share experiences and, and we can excel at physics as well. And I told you as well that, you know, the, the, the award that she, she just received. She also has a book written. So, so you can see that uh, she's somebody who has a lot going for her and that can inspire us. And it would be nice for us to invite her, uh, you know, maybe when we have the, uh, the in-person ASP, um, hopefully she will be, the time will be right uh, so that she can talk to us in person. Um, but at the moment, um, I think we can, uh, we can stop the conversation.
her email is on the agenda page. If you have uh, any question, you feel that you need to contact her, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you all for, for coming. I know it's a little bit later there for you all than it is for me. So I appreciate you taking the, the time in your evening. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Thanks Chanda, we'll be in touch. Yes, good, yeah. good talking to you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh,